In the first cold open of the series, we see Kenny struggling to hang on to a striped bass. A first time viewer would naturally assume Kenny caught this fish fair and square, but veterans of the show know that this vignette foreshadows the true cunning genius that is Kenny Hotz. The couch scene begins soon after, and Kenny immediately draws in the audience with a series of machine gun puns. I smell like fish and I've caught a lot of I bait the fish with my allure. I've tackled a lot of boxes, my friend. God, what the f How did Kenny get so good at his puns? When Kenny was in elementary school, he would stand at the front of the class and practice his wordplay by saying, give me any word and I'll tell you a joke. This talent is on display in his Triumph of the Will series when he's busking for money. Do you know that I give you tell me a word, I can make a joke out of any word. Can, um, what is the the poorest type of can. Mexican. All I can say is Jesus. That's the word I know. Jesus. Why, did Je why didn't Jesus play hockey? He kept getting nailed to the boards. <laughs> Giraffe. Guy goes to the doctor. God goes, what's wrong? He goes, oh, my wiener's orange and has brown spots on it. Have you done anything weird lately? He says, no, I've just been boning giraffes. Most of the jokes are KVS rehashes, but there you go. Moving on with the fishing competition, Spenny visits an expert fisherman and catches what I think is a brown bullhead. But if there's any anglers among us, let us know in the comments. Seeing Spenny so genuinely excited with boyish delight is one of the more wholesome moments in the show, even if it's just for a few frames. Meanwhile, Kenny visits a few places of his own. Starting with daily seafood, Kenny buys a wild striped bass for his scheme. Once at the marina, he visits fisherman Steve Gala and sets out to record catching the fish. Let's stop here and talk about Steve for a moment. Yes, Steve is a real fisherman. Yes, he was the charter captain for mainlander boat charters. I don't know the name of his boat in particular, but the business has since closed sometime after the competition was filmed. A subscriber suggested that because Steve Gala is wearing the same outfit on both days, Kenny could have filmed himself catching the fish on the same day that the guys went out fishing, and therefore the narrative of this episode is fake. I really cannot make any meaningful conclusions on this theory. First, and most obvious, I tried to check his outfit, but the footage from the day of the catch has a filter to indicate it occurred in the past, so I can't compare the color or texture of his clothes. Yes, he certainly looks like he's wearing the same shirt and shorts with his belt dangling out, but I can't say for sure. I know I've worn the same clothes two days in a row before, so I don't think it's a big deal. But I didn't give up there. Next, I tried to prove these events were filmed on two different days by checking the direction of the wind. See the flag blowing in the wind towards the city? I was hoping on the second day, the wind would be blowing in a different direction, or maybe not at all. It wasn't. It was also blowing towards the city on day two, which is completely normal for prevailing winds to blow from sea to land. Well, what about the other boats that surround Steve's boat when Kenny boards? There is this boat on the right and this boat on the left. On the second day, the same boats are still there. I looked really hard at all the frames and I, I've, I'm confident concluding that those are the same boats. Therefore, I can neither prove nor disprove Kenny actually went a day early to film himself catching a dead fish. However, it's not over yet. We're going to come back to this in a few minutes. So after visiting the marina, Kenny stops at the game store and picks up a fishing video game. I set out to find it by googling all the fishing games for the original Xbox. There were only a handful of them. And then I searched the available YouTube playthroughs for the one with the guy in the orange hat and the orange striped jacket until I found this. Rapala Pro Fishing for the original Xbox. Then I remembered that Reddit user Jobless Deadbeat actually won Kenny's Xbox at a recent live show. So I went back to that user's post to see if the Xbox came with any games, and there it was. I'll add a link in the description to that Reddit post if you want to read the story on that. It involves candy suppositories. Anyway, soon enough the guys set sail on beautiful Lake Ontario, and once anchored, Kenny immediately begins antagonizing Spenny. I got a hat! I got a hat fish! Can I? Can I got I? a dog fish! What are you kidding? I'll f***ing make you shut up Ow, by kissing me. You know what? It's amazing how a man changes over the years. Mayday, mayday, Spencer's mother is a whore. Kenny, I'm shut up! Don't you talk about my mother! And she was very, she was very 
promiscuous. Spencer? Yes. Well, okay. Okay. So am I. Yeah. I was. Well, you and your mother were very promiscuous. From there, we all know how it ends. So let's move on to the main conspiracies of the episode. Some people have said that Spenny preemptively wearing the life jacket verifies the show as fake because he must have known that he was going to be pushed into the water, which to me is laughable. Like, have you seen the show before? Spenny is paranoid about his personal safety. Spenny, this is like a dairy farm, not Chernobyl. What are you doing? Antiviral cream that I can put on my cheek. And I want to make sure that uh, no hunters or anybody, everybody could see me. He wears the life jacket because he's paranoid of the boat sinking, not because he knows he's going to be pushed into the water at some point. How do I know that? Because he wore a life jacket the day before when he was definitely not going to be pushed into the water. That being said, he may have known that he was going to be pushed into the water at some point. Oh, come on, man. What the f***? But not in the way the previous conspiracy suggests. First, let's establish that Spenny has pretty good reaction time. even when drunk. What the f Albeit sometimes he has a slowed reaction, like when having baby juice thrown on him. No, I'm not. Oh! Oh, yes. Maybe he's just used to that, so it didn't startle him. I don't know. My point is, why doesn't Spenny react when he is pushed off the boat? Why doesn't he try to grab onto the boat or grab onto Kenny's arms? He scrambles to grab at things and touch the ground. And once Spenny is in the water, why doesn't he try to swim back to the boat? Why does he just tread water? Does he actually think that Kenny will fire the flare launcher at him? Is this an indicator of a scripted narrative? I studied the scene and I do think it's possible that he may have known he was about to be pushed in but not in the sense that it was scripted and then acted out. I don't think Spenny boarded the vessel knowing that he would go swimming, which the conspiracy theory suggests. Because I know that there are times when Spenny goes along with the prank, I think Kenny may have approached him at one point during the excursion and suggested they do this without filling Spenny in on all the details. After all, Kenny's plan depended on getting Spenny off the boat. Listen, man, this is pretty boring. We need to make a funny episode. How about I push you in the water? Like uh, That would make a funny bit. You already have the life jacket on. And as far as Spenny understood, that's all that was going to happen. He was going to get pushed in for a moment just for the shot. That's why he didn't fight to grab onto something. And that's why he didn't immediately swim back to the boat. What he didn't know was that Captain Steve was going to sail away. What he didn't know was that he was going to be left bobbing for half an hour. And he certainly didn't know that Kenny was going to catch a fish. And that's a theme that I see happen in other competitions as well. The idea that Spenny knew something was about to happen, but he didn't know the exact details or to what extent things would escalate. We'll talk about that more when we get there. Now, whether Spenny knew he was going to be pushed in or not is all speculation and it's all quite irrelevant anyway. The only thing that really matters is that Spenny didn't know the boat was going to sail away and leave him bobbing for half an hour, during which time Kenny would claim to catch a fish. Which leads us to the other big controversy surrounding this episode. Because Kenny admitted that he was going to cheat. I'm telling you right now, I am cheating. I'm cheating. You're gonna go figure out how I'm gonna cheat. And because Spenny did not accuse Kenny's recording of being a cheat, or even question it, then Spenny must have known this was coming and the whole episode must be scripted. So let's ask ourselves, why didn't Spenny accuse Kenny of cheating here? Well, I'll tell you. All of the dialogue and all of the events that happened between the journey to the marina and actually filming on the boat are checkpoints. They're devised by Kenny to destroy any and all notions that Spenny may have had about the ways Kenny could be cheating. This may sound like casual banter. How do I know you didn't like go up and bribe the captain to like uh, get the fish to come over to my rod? Like, 
you don't even make sense. Uh, I think it would be good for you to search the entire crew, everybody, every case. Don't you every worry. Knapsack. I already smell fish. I did too. But what Kenny is actually doing, and this is really important, is preemptively and systematically eliminating from Spenny's mind any of the possible methods Kenny could be cheating. He's manipulating Spenny into composing a mental list of all the possible ways Kenny could be cheating and then crossing them off one by one. So when Kenny puts his real plan into motion, Spenny won't even see it coming because he will have convinced himself that all of Kenny's plans to cheat have been disrupted and the only remaining possible outcome is a fair competition. So the question we should be asking is, what were Kenny's cheating checkpoints? Number one, bribery. How do I know you didn't like go up and, and bribe the captain to like uh, get the fish to come over to my rod? Like Kenny was about to say bribery, but Spenny beat him to the punch. Bribery has cycled into Spenny's mind as a possible method of cheating. However, in Spenny's mind, bribing the captain would be a ridiculous notion because it would be impossible to guarantee a positive outcome. Bribe the captain to like uh, get the fish to come over to my rod? Like, you don't even make sense. It would be irrational to assume that the captain could get any fish to come and bite the bait. However, it never occurs to Spenny that Steve could be bribed into providing a negative outcome to go to a place with no fish whatsoever because that would mean Kenny also wouldn't catch any fish. So while Spenny laughs at the notion of bribery, what Kenny has really accomplished is eliminating bribery from Spenny's list of possible methods of cheating. Spenny has convinced himself that bribery would be ludicrous and therefore Spenny won't be accusing Kenny of bribing the captain. Furthermore, Kenny reinforces this later on by saying, If I was cheating, I'd be catching fish. Shut up! Not you, not Just shut up! Fish. Kenny makes sure to drive the point home that Spenny, not catching fish, couldn't possibly be related to any scheme because that would mean Kenny himself also wouldn't catch any fish. Number two, hidden fish. Uh, I think it would be uh, good for you to search the entire crew, everybody, every case. Don't you every worry. Knapsack. Kenny encourages Spenny to search the crew and the boat for hidden fish. In addition to that, Kenny lets Spenny catch him bringing a fish onto the boat. So at this point in Spenny's mind, the search has paid off. He has caught Kenny red-handed and foiled his plan to cheat. The only remaining possibility is a fair competition, which he indicates in a pretentious speech about what the show should be. I just wanted to have a fair competition. And right now it's anybody's game, and Kenny, that's the way the show should be. Kenny has eliminated from Spenny's mind the possibility of a fish being hidden away on the boat. Spenny has verified with his own eyes that there are no fish on board. So when Kenny presents this footage, Spenny naturally concludes that the fish came out of the lake. Now, I'm not done yet. This part about the fish in the beer cooler actually goes deeper. I believe its main purpose was to be discovered by Spenny, but it's also part of other minor checkpoints. The smell. I already smell fish. I did too. Because Kenny's clothes probably smell like fish from the day before, the fish in the cooler serves to throw Spenny off the trail of Kenny's dead fish. Now before you say it in the comments, I know that Kenny had multiple sets of the same clothes for filming multi-day competitions, so he may have had clean clothes here. But I also wouldn't put it past him to wear the stinky fish shirt and flaunt his transgressions right in front of Spenny. Either way, the dead cooler fish answers the question as to where the smell was coming from a moment ago in the van. So Spenny has no reason to suspect the smell is coming off of Kenny's clothes from yesterday because this fish was in the van the whole time. Furthermore, the best part of all of this that never even got any credit, it's not even the same fish from yesterday. Kenny went to the trouble of sourcing a second fish, a different species of fish so that it doesn't match the fish from the tape. This is the depth and foresight of Kenny's methodical genius. He eliminates any possible questions about the authenticity of his videotaped catch, because if Kenny later shows a tape with the same fish that Spenny found in the cooler, 
Spenny might find it suspicious and, you know, maybe begin to question the correlation between the two fish. I think that's a steelhead trout, by the way. Finally, the other minor checkpoint is the hat. Can I wear this hat? You know, Kenny makes not a big deal, but he makes sure Spenny notices the hat. So when Spenny sees the tape, he'll notice Kenny wearing the hat on the footage and believe the authenticity of the footage. So enough about dead fish. Earlier, I talked about trying to determine if Kenny actually filmed this the day before the competition, or if the whole thing is fake and he filmed it on the same day as the competition. But I wasn't able to draw any meaningful conclusions with the suggested evidence of Captain Steve. I always approach these analysis videos as if the series is real, and then I look for inconsistencies. So let's just say, for the sake of argument, that the whole thing is real, and Kenny went out the day before the competition and filmed Catching the Fish. Well, logically, Spenny would have to be kept in the dark about the whole thing. Something would have to happen to keep Spenny busy and unable to follow Kenny to see what he was up to. That sounds reasonable, right? So can I prove that Spenny was kept busy at another location so that Kenny could film his cheat? Yes. Yes, I can. A lot of planning would have gone into this scheme. Reserving an additional day on the boat to film the scheme, conjuring ways to preemptively disarm Spenny's accusations of cheating, and coordinating a plan to ensure Spenny wouldn't find out Kenny was on Steve's boat the day prior to the competition. There were key assets in play to ensure Kenny's success. What were those assets? The girls. Because they're the main point of contact for sourcing, the girls are privy to each guy's plans before every competition. Kenny tells the girls well in advance to book Captain Steve for an extra day so he can film his cheat, and Spenny tells the girls to find him a fisherman who can teach him how to fish. Because the girls know Kenny is going to film his cheat, they coordinate with him to plan Spenny's day accordingly. Kenny gets the girls to not only find a fisherman who will teach Spenny how to fish, but to find a guy with a boat who will take Spenny in the boat, far away for a few hours. How do I know the main intention was to take Spenny away? Because Spenny meets the guy at the docks. Then they sail away. Then the guy teaches Spenny how to fish near some docks. The guy could have taught Spenny how to fish right at the marina where they met. The only reason to take Spenny on a trip around the lake is to take control away from him. Take power away from him. Get him on the boat, drive him far away, and burn up the time that Kenny needs to film his cheat. Spenny never had a chance to catch Kenny. The girls made sure of it. So let's build on that. If all of this is real, then the girls would have booked Spenny's expert at a marina far away from the Port Credit Harbor Marina so he wouldn't catch Kenny meeting up with Captain Steve. But if it's all fake, then the girls could have booked Spenny into the same marina as Captain Steve. When Spenny is with his expert, we don't see what marina they start out from, but we do see these poles made to look like the main mast of a sailing ship. I don't live in Toronto, but I could not find any photographs of those masts at Port Credit. So I'm inclined to say that Spenny went to a different marina than Port Credit, which would be consistent with the episode being real. Based on the evidence of differing marinas, and the evidence of taking Spenny on a completely unnecessary trip around the lake, I will conclude that Kenny's cheat was in fact filmed the day before the competition. These tasks were undertaken to protect Kenny's scheme from Spenny. The tasks would have been completely unnecessary had the show been scripted. If it were fake, they could have just filmed Spenny by the dock at the Port Credit Marina right before or after the competition. And they didn't do that. But beyond the surface of a fishing competition, this episode pays homage to one of the greatest films in cinematic history. Well, first of all, what is homage? It's a public acknowledgement or show of respect to a predecessor. In the DVD commentary to season one's Awake, Kenny claims that the opening sequence pays homage to some of his favorite films. The warriors are from Spartacus. The samurai are from Seven Samurai. The cowboys are from High Noon. The soldiers are from the Nuremberg Rally. And the generals are from Dr. Strangelove. 
In the commentary, Kenny says he forgets where the knights are from, but I'm guessing that they're from 1952's Ivanhoe. Where are the knights from? I have noticed that Kenny also pays homage by surrounding himself with memorabilia to some amazing classic films. There's a poster from The Great Dictator in the Living Room during seasons 2 and 3. It's a 1940 anti-war film starring Charlie Chaplin. The whole thing is basically a satire to make a mockery out of Hitler, so, you know, Kenny definitely drew some inspiration from that. I also noticed this poster from Kenny's room during season two. Fans have speculated that it's from the 1927 film Metropolis, but it is not. It is from the 1926 Soviet comedy The Three Million Trial. A man sells his house for 3 million rubles on a Saturday. In 1926, that's roughly 44,000 Canadian, which is roughly 750,000 today. But he cannot deposit the cash at the bank until Monday. His cheating wife tells her lover about the money, who then conspires to steal it. Unfortunately, two other men, a pickpocket and a professional thief, catch wind of the fortune and also plot to steal it, leading to, of course, hilarious hijinks. Now, for a long time, I thought this poster above the couch was referring to Battleship Potemkin, a film about the 1905 mutiny of sailors over their oppressive officers. I asked some Russian people about the poster, and they told me it does not refer to a film, but to an actual battleship, Battleship Aurora. In 1917, the Aurora was the first capital ship to hoist the red flag, and later in October of 1917, the Aurora fired a blank shell from her cannon, which was the signal for the Bolsheviks to storm the Winter Palace and begin the Communist Revolution. Which leads me to the point I'm building up to. Within Bigger Fish, there is a scene which is replicated from a very famous film. Whether by happenstance or by design, it mimics the tone, the characters, the very essence of its predecessor. Bigger Fish pays homage to what is often regarded by cinema scholars as the greatest film in cinematic history, Citizen Kane. If I were to summarize Citizen Kane into two sentences, it is the story of a man who is relinquished by his mother while he is still a young boy to receive the best education possible. He experiences great success in life, but on his deathbed his accomplishments are of no comfort and he yearns for his lost childhood. If you've seen the episode of The Simpsons where Mr. Burns longs for his childhood teddy bear Bobo, then you've seen Citizen Kane. Looking at the Union Forever scene in Citizen Kane, Mrs. Kane sits in the foreground, signing away her and her husband's parental rights to their son in exchange for $50,000 annually. That's $50,000 in 1871, which is over one and a quarter million dollars today, annually. The money comes as interest from owning the rights to a mine which has struck gold. Since the rights to the mine are in her name, she has the sole right to sign away her and her husband's parental rights to a banker. Now, I asked the internet how the father doesn't have the right to stop this, which to me seems like a significant plot hole. How does any one parent have the sole right to sign away custody of a child? And the internet told me it's actually not a big plot hole and I should just enjoy the film instead of trying to understand parental rights from over 150 years ago. Anyway, the scene is arranged in descending order of power with the most powerful characters in the foreground. Mrs. Kane and the banker, Walter Thatcher. They are completely expressionless. They are in control of the situation. And they wear dark formal clothing as if attending a funeral. It's very much a final goodbye to Charles, so the funeral attire adds great depth to the scene. Mr. Kane occupies the midground. He wears lighter, working-class clothes and is depicted as a minor inconvenience to the ultimate goal of relinquishing custody of Charles to the banker. Mr. Kane protests the surrender of his son, but while he is privy to the conversation, he has no control over the situation. Finally, young Charles Kane can be seen through the window frame in the background of the cabin. His voice is faint, and his words are indistinguishable. He's completely excluded from the conversation happening inside, so he carries on in his own little world outside in the snow. The window frame forms a boundary between Charles and the discussion happening which will dictate his future. His fate is the subject of the scene, and his opinion on the matter is completely irrelevant. He has the least amount of power in the scene. In fact, he has no power. Fast forward to 2006, and we see this scene. 
I'm going to have to use all my brain power to develop a plan to cheat, integrating Spencer's two rules. The visuals make a striking resemblance to the scene in question. Kenny, the character with the most power, is placed in the foreground closest to the camera. Spenny, with no power whatsoever, is placed as far from the camera as the room will allow. Kenny is calm, stoic, unemotional. The audio tunes into his conversation with the audience and leaves Spenny muttering a faint and indistinguishable explanation of the rules. Nothing Spenny has to say here will change anything that happens in the competition. The door frame forms the boundary between the two worlds, Spenny's fair fishing competition and Kenny's scheme. No matter how Spenny tries, he will never be able to bridge this boundary and gain control within Kenny's world. Kenny already has full command of the competition. Spenny's fate is the subject of the scene, and his opinions about the rules are completely irrelevant, which leads to the final moments of the scene in Citizen Kane. After signing away Charles' guardianship, Mrs. Kane calls him inside and says to the banker, I've had his trunk packed for a week. As in, Mrs. Kane had her mind made up a week ago, and all of Mr. Kane's protesting was just noise. Spenny's futile attempts to take control were just that. Noise. His fate had already been determined, and there was nothing he could do to change it. The entire episode is a testament to just how powerless Spenny is. He spends the competition trying to express his superiority in preparation, knowledge, and execution, but ultimately, Spenny is powerless. Powerless to take control, powerless to change the outcome, powerless to put up a fight. And if we look at the end credits, we can see Robert Patton listed in the thanks to section. So you're telling me that there was Bobby footage for this episode and we never got to see it. In keeping with the theme of this video, let's pay homage to Bobby's absence. I rate this episode three and a half out of five missing Bobbies. Some good laughs, refreshing change of scenery, classic Spenny. A full Bobby for the narrative. The cold open is great foreshadowing, not necessarily of who will win, but of the cheat to come. And then the announcement of the scheme allows for a change in episode construction. If only I would have come up here yesterday. Instead of unveiling the plan at the end of the episode, we're let in on the scheme at the nine minute mark. All tension as to who would win is eliminated, and what we're left with is the mystery of how. How will Kenny trick Spenny into believing this footage? The entire scheme hinges on getting Spenny in the water, and we don't know it until, surprise! So for the viewer, this change in narrative construction keeps the show fresh. Definitely a full bobby for interactions. Most of the reactions here were on Spenny's part, so half a bobby. And the captain as a tertiary character, not only being in on the scheme, but also participating in it by convincing Spenny that the fishing spot was still good, is worth half a bobby, I think. And finally, half a bobby for rewatchability. It's a middle of the pack episode with good entertainment value, but not a regular watch. So let's keep it going and pick the next video. Boxer. Okay, we're going to talk, or speculate rather, about how much time Spenny actually spent in the closet. So what do you think? Did Spenny know the push was coming? Do you think the guys intentionally framed the shot to emulate Citizen Kane? Let me know what you think in the comments. As always, thanks for watching. Like and subscribe to help the channel, and I'll see you on the next one.